rest my weary head on somebody's shoulder. May 15th meeting of the Harvard roll. Commission to order. Uh, Ms. Pazinski, would you call the roll, please? Betsy Kramer. Present. Corey Bantelin. Here. Frank Kelly. Here. Jim Sloan. Here. Helene Webb. Here. And Bill Spicer and Dennis Power are absent. Okay, uh, Mr. Eden, are there any changes to the agenda? Madam Chair, there are no changes tonight. This would be the point of public comment, but there seems to be none. So I will close the public comment. The approval of the minutes. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Minutes are approved. Uh, department update, Mr. Reedman, please. Well, good evening, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Um, in terms of council actions, the council is currently holding work sessions with all city departments to review the recommended fiscal year 2015 budget. Uh, our staff presented its recommended budget to the council on Monday, May 5th, and um, Mr. Bossy and I also went and made a presentation to the Finance Committee just this past Tuesday, and both went quite smoothly, and the council is expected to uh, complete all the, the work sessions and do the final approval of the citywide budget on June 17th. Um, on to the MTD Downtown Waterfront Shuttle. Uh, as the Commission may recall, in July of 2013, after the City's fiscal year 2014 budget had been approved, the Council moved that the Waterfront Department should absorb $40,000 of funding shortfall for the MTD Downtown Waterfront Electric Shuttle Program. This year, following the budget report to the Harbor Commission in February and the budget recommendation in March, Staff learned that the overall MTD contract is due to increase on July 1st, 2014. So as a result, the Waterfront Department's share of the MTD shuttle will increase from the $40,000 previously discussed to $76,900 in, uh, in FY 2015, next fiscal year. Since it's necessary to maintain the harbor leg of the downtown Waterfront electric shuttle to provide booster shuttles during cruise ship visits, the entire cost of the department share of the MTD shuttle, that is the harbor leg plus the booster shuttles during cruise ship visits, that will all be allocated to the cruise ship expense line item of the budget since it's all related to the cruise ships. Um, and then in terms of tentative agenda items for the June meeting, if we have a June meeting, which at this point it looks like we probably won't, um, so this is probably more accurate to say tentative agenda item for the July meeting, will be a five-year review of uses in the harbor commercial zone which will be a good launching off point for our local coastal program review, which Carl is going to give you a report on tonight. So uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from the commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Kelly. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Reedman, do we have any idea why they missed by almost 100% on the MTD estimation? A um, couple things happened. The MTD had a... Uh, scheduled increase, which they have an annual CPI increase every July 1st, and when the um, finance, not finance, when the city administrator and transportation staff were reviewing that, they decided to allocate, to change the way it was being allocated, and um, allocate the waterfront's share of the expense uh, to match the, the, um, the ratio of passengers that actually use that leg of the shuttle. So, for example, 7.12% of the passengers that use the downtown State Street and Waterfront Shuttle, 7% um, of them go from the Stearns Wharf to the Harbor Leg. And so now we're being allocated 7% of the $1.2 million MTD contract. So that's why it's almost doubling. Okie doke. I'm not wild about it, but what's to do? Any question, other questions, comments? I was wondering also if the, uh, the amount is flexible. If, for instance, there are fewer passengers, will there be less charged? Or vice versa, if there are more passengers, more ships, will there be more charged? Madam Chair, I spoke with Jerry Estrada of MTD today about this issue, and they need to review this last batch of cruise ship visits and how many passengers came through and they also need to look at the fare box revenue because on, on those visits they've really been packing the people on those shuttles and, and we do get credit for the fare box revenue. So there could be some adjustments to this. 
Jerry's going to get back to me, and we're going to meet in about in the next couple of weeks over this. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Co Commissioner Sloan. So when, um, thank you. Um, so when we talk about the, the $40,000 or the $77,000 that start next year, is that net of the fare box revenue, or how does that get calculated into it? Do they look at that and then they set the rate for the next year? Or how, how exactly does that work? The actual, uh, Commissioner Sloan, the actual charge is about $86,000, and then the fare box revenue is subtracted from that, and that's how we get to the seventy-six. It's about $10,000 fare box revenue. Uh, Commissioner Webb. Um, is it cost effective um, for the waterfront? I mean, that the passengers come to the harbor. Um, is there any record of, of just the rest of the year, not just during the cruise ship times? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Webb, the harbor leg of the MTD downtown waterfront shuttle is the least used segment. As I mentioned, it's 7 percent. Um, so it's 93 percent of the passengers are using it along State Street and then over to the zoo. So it's, it's, it is underutilized. However, um, you'll see tonight Brian's going to present um, a wrap-up of the season's cruise ship visits. And it, if you wrap it all up into the expenses, um, it, it works with the, cruise, with the amount of revenue we're getting from the cruise ships. It covers the MTD expenses and then some. And, and the police for, that you have to pay extra for? Yes, well. actually the police, um, we have two police usually as part of the facility security plan. And um, the, the cruise lines actually reimburse us for the police expense. We get reimbursement on the, on the PD. Great. Thank you very much. I guess any other? No? Thanks a lot. Uh, business services report, please, Mr. Vossi. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, tonight I'm going to provide you with our wrap-up of the spring season, and I'll go through some slides more on the collaboration side and operational side of, of the cruise ships, and then I'll finish up with a few slides that, uh, again, wrap up the spring season as well as a summary slide of the fiscal year 2014. So jumping right into it, um, as I stated, this is a cruise ship visits involve a significant amount of collaboration amongst a whole bunch of different folks. Um, it's spearheaded um, by the city of Santa Barbara in particular, um, the waterfront department, um, and everybody plays a role in that. Um, Brian Schlegel, our admin analyst, um, spearheads that effort along with our parking staff who um, set up all the tents and uh, cones and make sure everything's uh, up and operating before, usually even before the ship comes in. Um, we also um, work with the police department, as Mr. Reedman just said. Usually two officers are down there, including a cruiser. Um, and then public works staff also works with us, the streets division as well as the transportation division. Um, from there, the other primary collaborators are the downtown organization, Visit Santa Barbara, and the Chamber of Commerce. Um, they staff um, the hospitality tents as well as um, recruit the various volunteers, a whole host of volunteers that come down uh, each and every cruise ship visit. And, of course, uh, MTD plays a role as well um, as far as transportation is concerned. And this collaborative effort really results in a, in a smooth friendly, easy transition um, for folks getting off the cruise ship and being able to not have to stress a whole lot about where they're going, what they're doing. Uh, we make it pretty simple for them. And the cruise ships have, have raved about that process. They're very happy with how we um, get people on and off the ship. And um, we've also heard the same thing from uh, many passengers who say this is their favorite spot on their four- or seven-day journey. It's the easiest to find their excursions, and um, they really enjoy it, which hopefully they'll the idea is they'll come back. One other part of um, the waterfront department that oftentimes you don't notice um, that plays a significant role with cruise ships is our Harbor Patrol. Um, they provide medical assistance for folks coming off the ship. Um, they also provide um, an, more of an escorting uh, service as far as getting the cruise ship tenders to and from the ships in, in cases of inclement weather. Um, I know it's hard to fathom right now with it being so hot outside, but a few weeks ago it was foggy to the point where 
Um, the Harbor Patrol spent basically uh, two of the boats spent the entire day um, helping the tenders go back and forth um, from the cruise ship to sea landing because you could not see very far in front, in front of yourself. Um, they've also provided uh, various transportation um, for different agencies in the county, including the Air Pollution Control District, if they're needed um, out on the ship, as well as the County of Santa Barbara's Public Health Department, um, the sheriff, uh, and a whole host of other agencies. So they play a, a, very, a very big role as well with cruise ship visits. As far as the process goes, um, folks uh, hop on a tender, and the tender then comes in and drops uh, passengers off at sea landing. This is an example of one of the tenders. From there, they're routed through sea landing, um, which is a secure facility, um, and they make their way through sea landing out along the new uh, sea landing walkway. Uh, which is always a pleasant walk, especially now being refurbished. And they eventually are met by a whole host of volunteers at the hospitality tents. Uh, again, our, our, our partners in this downtown organization, Visit Santa Barbara and the Chamber, all put together the, the volunteer staffing. And the Chamber, as well as Visit Santa Barbara, do have a staff member, or I'm sorry, downtown organization do have a staff member there as well, helping coordinate. Here are a few photos of the hospitality tent. You can see it's a, a beehive of activity. This is the first place people come to, trying to figure out where they're going, what they're doing. They've previously arranged these trips, so um, the volunteers are very, uh, it's, it's very easy for them to find where they're going. Volunteers help them do that. We've also put together a very nice signage program so they know exactly where to go and stand to catch their particular um, bus, either public transit or private, and move along to their excursion. Here is just in front of the hospitality tents. On the left, you'll see that's the, the space for the public buses. So that'd be MTD coming in and out. Again, we um, hire an additional four MTD shuttles um, with each cruise ship, or I should say with most cruise ships, in addition to essentially four others. So there's roughly eight MTD um, shuttles going at all times of the day, um, generally about seven to ten minutes apart, transporting people around. And on the right is, again, the folks queuing up for the public, uh, for the MTD, sorry. And this is an example of one of, the, one of the bits of signage that we have. This is one of the separate uh, side excursions. Um, so we have them designated into various stations. They go, they stand next to their station, the trolley's there, and they can be easily transported to and from their excursion. So it works out really well. So that's kind of a, a quick, in a nutshell, summary of how it works on cruise ships. We invite you down there in the fall when they come back. Again, they just come on the, the shoulder season, and it does provide an economic boost uh, for downtown as well as waterfront businesses. As far as by the numbers, uh, for the spring season, we had a total of 17 visits. Gross revenue generated from those 17 visits was almost $282,000. Um, backing out the MTD booster shuttle fees of $68,000. They're about $4,100 per visit, roughly depending on the size of the ship. Um, then we back out the $20,000, which is half a year, or in this particular fiscal year, half a year of the MTD waterfront shuttle fees. Again, that will go up, as, as Mr. Reedman mentioned. We then have public works fees. Um, those are the fees um, with closing off a lane and things like that. Um, that, totals, that totaled for the spring a little over $5,000. And then miscellaneous fees of not, about $15,600. And miscellaneous fees, everything from um, cruise ship uh, industry association fees, um, payment to the downtown organization, as well as the Chamber of Commerce for um, the, the staff that they, the one staff member each that they keep down there on those visits. Um, we provide the volunteers um, with jackets, uh, and we maintain those jackets so they do need to be cleaned. Um, supplies, expenses, um, and kind of every the little things in between. So net revenue for the spring season alone uh, was uh, $172,395. That is a little different than what appears in your uh, staff report. And um, reason is, is we've been able to, over the last week and a half, really drill down on these numbers um, with that last cruise ship coming in on May 4th. 
As for the fiscal year, um, the fall of 2013, as well as the, the spring visits I just mentioned, we had a total of 28 cruise ship visits this year uh, with gross revenue um, totaling almost $486,000. And that's based on the ship manifest. It includes um, both passengers. We charge on both passengers as well as their crew. So um, when we think of people coming ashore, we focus more on the passengers and not so much the crew. Um, and again, that total is about $486,000. Backing out a year's worth of booster shuttle, MTD booster shuttle fees at and almost $114,500. The year of the MTD uh, waterfront shuttles at $40,000, our public works fees almost $7,500, and then those miscellaneous fees totaling about $17,000. Our estimated net revenue for the fiscal year um, is at $306,000. And I should let you know that as far as visitors are concerned, at least on the passenger side of things, um, we had 68,432 passengers um, aboard those 28 uh, cruise ships. And in addition, there were 28,740 crew members. And again, we charge for both of them, the entire ship manifest. And that is a summary again, quick down and dirty summary of the numbers for the cruise ships for both the spring season as well as the fiscal year. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, any questions from the commission? Commissioner Webb. Thank you, Brian, for that report. Um, uh, in terms of the staff time and the harbor patrols, um, are they, is this during their regular time or on a Sunday when a ship comes in, is there overtime? And where does that uh, reflect? That's a, that's a great question. Madam Chair, Commissioner Webb, um, we, as far as our staff time um, with our administrative staff time, that generally results in overtime um, for that employee or... Um, possibly swapping out a day during the week if they have to be here on the weekends. Parking staff, they're here you know, basically 365 days a year, except a couple of holidays. So it's part of their normal process. They just have to work that into their normal schedule. And um, I believe it's the same thing for our Harbor Patrol as far as they're here every day of the year as well. So when we factor in, well, I should say we don't factor in those staff costs as we wor work on this. Really, the only staff costs we would have to factor in would be um, of our, our admin staff who, who supports the program on those particular days and is out at the hospitality tent on a weekend. But if it's during the week, it's, it's a normal day. Uh, Commissioner Sloan. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brian. Um, so when you look at uh, the offset between the, the MTD fee and the and what we we're predicting for revenue. So basically it becomes a wash if I, what we're saying is we lost the oil boats and we lost the, the museum revenue, which is about 300,000 and that's about what this gets out to. And then, but we're covering the added cost of the, the MTD that we've had to pay for the last couple of years. And so I, I under, understand that. How far in advance do we actually know how many boats are coming a year. I mean, because the number keeps going up. It has been going up nicely, and it's the shoulder season, which is good and things. So do you know? Madam Chair, Commissioner Sloan, um, they try and plan out a few years in advance, um, but oftentimes, as I've mentioned in previous discussions on cruise ships, you know, they can call the day before and say, we're not coming. Right. Um, so at the current time, we have a rough estimate. We, we don't like to set anything in stone um, for the coming year, but we estimate between 22 to 27, possibly next year at this current time. And again, that can be, they can come at us with new requests at, at any particular day. They can come at us and back out requests. So it's, it's really in flux until we get a whole lot closer to this season. So um, we anticipate about the same number next year as we, we've seen this year? Correct. And it looks like, uh, yeah. Uh, Maybe a few less. Right. Yeah. But about the same. Great. Thank you. Questions, comments? Uh, Commissioner Bantelon. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Brian. <clears throat> I have a quick question about park, or sorry, uh, MTD as well. Um, and I guess just just refresh my memory a little bit. A couple of years ago, when RDA went away, didn't didn't we pick up a little bit of that, or did that not happen? What 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 portion of that did, did we get? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Bantlin, that was the forty thousand dollar figure that we discussed. That was from 
that was the initial deal when RDA went away and then downtown parking picked up a share and waterfront picked up a small share and that was an estimate at the time um, and the estimate was forty thousand dollars after the fare box revenue and the fare box revenue turned out to be less than expected okay thanks for the, the history on that um, I wasn't surprised to read that uh, everybody is pleased uh, I was very lucky and had a tour thanks to um, Brian Slagle for the last uh, Sunday's visit and was extremely impressed at how well everything ran and how uh, agreeable everybody was and how everybody see all the visitors seem to be smiling and, and happy. So really a good job. Uh, thank you. Um, next would be the facilities report. Mr. Triberg, please. Uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, this evening I'm going to report on the pile driving out of Stearns Wharf and the dredging. And uh, the first report is on uh, the annual pile driving at Stearns Wharf with Cushman Contracting having recently completed uh, one of the largest projects we've done in, in quite a few years. Uh, they installed 50 wooden piles, several hundred feet of pile caps, uh, stringers and deck boards. We also removed about 56 piles this year, which is really rather unusual. The vast majority of the work was, took place on the, the, what we call the Seaward Finger Plank Park, right out here at the very end, and along the roadway. So there was all about three, almost four weeks of night work, and fortunately we didn't have any complaints this year, which was a, a nice break from other years when sometimes we get a few phone calls. Um, but the wharf remains open and operation the entire time, and it was a very significant project this year. Um, we budgeted $350,000 in the CIP this year, and it carried over about 50000 from the previous year. Uh, we didn't do any pile driving last year for the first time in quite a while, and uh, we wound up doing a very thorough inspection of every single pile. And this is from the, from the mud line with divers all the way up to the deck. So it really resulted in the largest project we've had uh, in almost 10 years. And in 2005, we had some very powerful storms and lost quite a few piles and actually had some reimbursement from FEMA that year. Um, the 56 piles that we disposed of, they're all uh, coated with creosote, and they're also wrapped with a, a, a high-density plastic wrapping so that the creosote is not exposed to the ocean. But the piles do disintegrate over time, and they have to be disposed of as hazardous materials. So this year we went about $20,000 over budget, mainly because we had so much expense in disposing of all those piles as hazardous material. But we're ahead of the game this year, so as we go into next year, uh, we won't have as large a project as in the past. We'll be able to restore our inventory. We usually keep enough of an inventory whereby if we were to have a, a serious storm and wash out a section of the roadway, we keep enough heavy timber on stock to go out there and replace a section as quickly as possible to get back up and running again. But it was success, a successful project, and the, the wharf is in good shape for, for another winter. The other project was the dredging, which you've heard about a couple times this year. <laughs> I'm pleased to report that uh, AIS Construction completed the dredging on April 16th. They removed a little over 250,000 cubic yards, which is a, a contractual limit. They could have kept going, but it, they really did a good job and kind of cleaned up the harbor rather rapidly. They discharged all the dredge sediment on East Beach, and I'll show you a few images here in a moment that are uh, kind of uh, dramatic in how much the beach changes. This is a little... Uh, this takes a moment to load, but in the old days when they used to do their volume calculations and determine where to dredge, they would take a pinpoint measurement at a given area and extrapolate the volumes, and it was really difficult to kind of tell what was going on. But nowadays, we have this kind of imaging, and as you go through on about every other day they go into a survey, you get a sense for just how much they remove and where all the sand is. So it's a really dramatic way to demonstrate what goes on and how much sand was out there, because at the very beginning of the job, um, you could just about walk across the harbor. You couldn't get by there at all. So this was done in about 32 days. After two days, they punched a channel, and, and for all intents and purposes, opened up the harbor after it had been closed for well over a week. Uh, but they dredged for 32 straight days without a breakdown, um, about 8,000 cubic yards a day, which is the, the most production they've had in many, many years. It wound up being very successful in that respect. 
East Beach took a beating on our March 1st storm this year. Uh, this is a picture that I took, that Scott and I took actually on March 1st down there to give an example of what it was like with waves washing right up against the back beach. Very, very unusual. Um, what it did, there had been no dredging uh, in the fall, which normally provides a little bit of a buffer. So the back beach was very, very exposed and exposed a bunch of uh, coastal armoring that people hadn't seen in years. Uh, some of it's asphalt, some of it's concrete. There's a, a timber pile wall that ex extends hundreds of feet that no one had seen for many, many decades. So it wasn't, nobody's quite sure when it went in, although I'm sure it went in after some dramatic storm back in the 30s or 40s. Um, putting 250,000 yards on a beach makes a dramatic difference. This is not long after the storm. You can see the kind of a steep scarp where it was eroded. And the dredge material just goes right on the beach. And over the course of 32 days, it builds it out and just makes a a huge difference. You can see the pile of sand out at the very end there. And the beach, which was about 10 or 20 feet wide, is probably two or 300 feet wide after all is said and done. And it creates a little bit of a peninsula. And then as the natural wave processes occur, it gradually moves that sand down coast towards the Cabrillo Bathhouse, Montecito, and Carpinteria. So it kind of restores the natural balance of sand along our shoreline. Uh, some good news. AIS has a contract with the Corps of Engineers until 2016. They worked out all those bugs that caused the delays to begin with. There's adequate funding in fiscal year 2015 to move on with the dredging, and Scott and I had a meeting with uh, Colonel Culleton from the LA district yesterday, as a matter of fact, and some key core folks, and uh, things look encouraging for outlying years. I think Scott mentioned to you we did an economic impact analysis recently and shared that with them, and uh, we're hoping that that's going to help us stay, uh, remain a, a priority harbor for funding with Congress and with the Corps of Engineers. So next year in the fall, we'll resume our regular fall and spring cycle dredging and um, hopefully avoid the situation we had this last year. So things are looking good for dredging in Santa Barbara Harbor. Uh, this concludes my report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Carl. Any questions? Commissioner Kelly. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Carl, any uh, thought given to when the storm had come through and cleared everything off and we saw all these old armaments on the beach to refreshing any of those before we buried them all up in sand again, or did we just bury them? Madam Chair, Commissioner Kelly, no one really gave any thought to that. We sort of knew that if we could resume dredging, they remain buried for the most part. So they, they remain a line of last defense. No one really knows anything about them. They went in once upon a time, so no one knows how deep they go or what it would take. So it would take a, a significant engineering effort to kind of figure out what to do. But uh, we're going to stick with the dredging and hope that we don't see them anymore because there's enough dredging to keep them covered for many, many years to come. Okay, thank you. No other questions? So thank you for your report. Our operations, Mr. Conman. Madam Chair and Commissioners, good evening. i uh, start with a sort of a, an unfortunate tale here. Uh, in the first case in, uh, of its kind in 15 years, a Southern California uh, sea urchin diver from Santa Barbara Harbor was convicted recently of poaching abalone, uh, the take of which has been banned since 1997, 17 years ago. Uh, the gentleman was uh, fined $15,000, lost his recreational and commercial fishing licenses and permits for life. Um, so this is a, a, a kind of a, a cautionary tale that the guy had um, uh, trophy-sized abalone aboard, 10-inch abalone, not a lot of them, but enough to uh, get the attention of our resource managers and uh, Cal Fish and uh, Wildlife and certainly the courts. And it's a reminder, I think, for all of us how seriously uh, our state agencies and the courts take the protection of our marine resources. And uh, like I, I use the expression cautionary tale because pe folks should think twice before they uh, fish where they're not supposed to fish, take animals they're not supposed to take because the consequences can, can be quite serious. This gentleman is going to be uh, having to figure out something else to do for a living for, uh, for the rest of his life. On a lighter note, we had a very successful Operation Clean Sweep on May 3rd. Uh, we had 40 dock workers uh, aided by a dozen divers, many of them from, from, uh, um, not yet. Many of them from um, uh, Salty Dog Dive Services, who uh, supplied, I think it was eight divers. And uh, we ended up collecting 1.2 tons of debris. And uh, this year's haul included such items as a fuel tank, microwave oven, dock steps, satellite dish, and boat liner. Uh, we'd particularly like to thank the volunteers who helped us this year. 
um, th their spirit was just remarkable. Everybody was having a great time, and it's kind of, you know, it, it's a fishing trip, you know. You never know what you're going to pull up, and everybody felt good about the, the mission of, of the seafloor litter removal program, which is now nine years uh, and counting, excuse me, eight years and counting, our ninth year. Uh, next year, we're going to finish up Marina One. We'll complete our uh, circumnavigation, if you will, of the harbor, and uh, we'll probably be somewhere close to 16, 17 tons by then. And then in 2016, we're going back to where we started, and uh, we're going to do it again for as many years as it takes, and it'll be very interesting to see the trend line. Hopefully, the numbers will be, you know, much less than they were this first time around. But I also wanted to particularly thank uh, the folks that made up the bulk of the volunteer effort, uh, including uh, Channel Keeper. They posted up big. They brought a whole bunch of folks. Maritime Museum, Santa Barbara Surf Rider, NOAA, the, and the Harbor Commission, Harbor Commissioners uh, themselves, Chair Kramer, uh, Commissioner Sloan, and Commissioner Webb were all down there uh, pitching in a hand. And you all look like you're having a good time. And, and I know we did. And it was a, really a very successful event. I wanted to conclude by showing you a few slides from that. Here's, here, here were the, the dock steps um, that I mentioned. This was, a, this was a boat liner. These things, you know, that are underneath the hulls of the boats, they... <laughs> It's really not a clean marina practice, I'll be, you know, honest with you, because what happens is the growth, instead of going on the hull, which is the purpose of it, right, goes on the bottom of the boat liner, which is sort of baggy and very difficult to clean. And if a boater doesn't attend to it, which is kind of the point of it, too, I don't have to attend to the bottom of my boat and get it clean because i got this boat liner, it gets heavy with growth and ultimately breaches in some part of it, therefore not functioning the way it's supposed to, and making it heavier and heavier until it snaps one of its lines and ends up on the seafloor, creating a huge blanket of litter and all smothering benthic organisms on the seafloor. So this is a reminder to folks. Uh, I don't intend to, to pursue anything municipal code-wise, but it, it is not a clean marina practice, and I would personally discourage folks from using these things. This is a dock cart. Um, it's, it's hard to tell which things in the bay ended up blown into the bay or, you know, accidentally, you know, during our windstorms or kicked into the bay or what have you. I'd say this probably accidentally went in. Uh, not, not so easy to claim for some of the other items like this toilet bowl with bong. It sounds like a modern art piece. Um, but I think they came up separately and, and were assembled for artistic purpose. But anyway, these are some of the things it's hard to argue were accidentally blown off the dock. Uh, this is a shot of the dumpster at the end of our efforts, um, and, and it's amazing how fast the weight adds up. Uh, like, I was surprised. I thought we had, like, 1,500 pounds, but it was well over, two, uh, 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 well over a ton. And finally, the, uh, uh, the group shot the, the, uh, of all, you know, most, some of the volunteers, some of them got their sandwich and left. Can't blame them. Um, but uh, this was a good portion of our volunteers. And again, uh, our deepest thanks to the community for showing up and helping us out for what we believe is a, a very right-minded project. And that concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for the report. And indeed, it was a fun day. Any questions, comments from the commissioners? No? No. no. Well, again, thanks a lot. I enjoyed the day. Good sandwiches, too. Okay. Um, on to new, new business. Would you read the staff report, please, Ms. Brzezinski? Item 6, Finance Department Investment Report. Recommendation that Harbor Commission receive a report from Finance Department staff on the city's investment policy and Waterfront Department interest revenue. Madam Chair, Commissioners, I ask a representative of the Finance Department to come deliver the report tonight. So we have Jeannie Wilson. She's the Treasury Manager for the Finance Department. She's the expert on this subject. So she's going to present the report tonight for us. Thank you. Thank you. Expert here tonight. Uh, my report may not be as fun as the others, but I'll, I'll try to make it as light as I can. Um, the purpose of my, uh, my report tonight is just to provide you an overview of the city's investment policy um, and its requirements. So I'll provide an overview, and then I will also provide you some historical data on uh, interest rates and earnings um, for the last 10 years. 
and follow up um, with the March investment report as to where we were at, at March 31st, 2014. So uh, we'll start off with the investment policy overview. Uh, the investment policy requirements, um, it, sorry, <laughs> it stab establishes the legally investments uh, for the city. It does not require an annual adoption of the policy. However, the city does feel it is best practice to bring forward the policy annually to incorporate any changes, statutory or administrative, uh, in the policy for council's consideration. Therefore, the city council does review and approve the policy every year uh, around the July timeframe. The investment policy is, government, uh, is governed by state code 53600. The policy establishes procedures and guidelines that will ensure the prudent management of public agency funds. It incorporates all the regulations specified by California code sections into the agency's investment program. Uh, the policy scope is uh, essentially the pooling of all funds. Uh, we have several enterprise funds along with the general fund. So we do pool the funds. Uh, the, the, uh, the funds excluded by the policy would be funds such as pension funds. Um, but all the enterprise funds are included in the pooling of funds. Therefore, we do allocate interest on a monthly basis to the various funds from, from the pooled funds. The statutory investment objectives in priority, safeguard the principal, meet the liquidity needs of the city, which is our cash flow needs, and achieve a return on investment. Essentially, we, um, we focus on yield last. We safeguard our, our uh, principal. We have to prioritize the liquidity needs of the city based on the disbursements needed throughout the year. And again, um, the uh, return on investment or the yield is, is the last item that we will uh, prioritize. Overall, the city's investment strategy is passive with investments are generally held to maturity. The policy also authorizes financial dealers and, in, and institutions. Currently, there are four brokers authorized. The brokers are eval evaluated annually and the, the city uh, relies on these brokers for its um, investment transactions throughout the year. The policy also defines suitable and authorized investments. It in establishes investing parameters, uh, diversification and maturities, the maximum maturity of five years with an average maturity of 2.5 overall of the city's portfolio. The policy also establishes reporting requirements to the governing body. We do provide monthly investment reports to the City Council, quarterly investment reports to both the Finance Committee and the City Council, and an annual statement of investment policy to the Finance Committee and the City Council is uh, approved annually, as I mentioned, about July of each year. Historical information. Um, this graph is rather telling. If you, uh, if you take a look at where we were in 2000 and 2001, you'll see that um, our interest rate and our interest earnings were significantly higher. Um, with a dip in uh, 05, um, back up in 08, and we are at historical lows. So just to give you an idea of, of where rates have been and where our revenue has been. And I know there's been a question of why are our earnings so low, and uh, I, hope, I hope this can demonstrate where we've uh, historically been with rates. Um, as far as our portfolio rate, um, this graph demonstrates where we are compared to the two-year Treasury note in red and the LAFE rate in green. Um, the city's portfolio re rate is demonstrated in blue, and as you can see, it does um, exceed those uh, two-year and LAFE rate as, as um, identified on the graph. This next chart um, gives us a comparison of our portfolio rate compared to the five-year Treasury note. Um, that five-year Treasury note has fluctuated uh, quite a bit in, in uh, the past few years. Um, it has bounced slightly back up, so the city's portfolio rate currently is trailing it slightly. Uh, 
Uh, next, I'll, I'll uh, review your the quarterly investment report as of March 31st, 2014. Uh, essentially, Treasury rates remain at exceptionally low levels. The fluctuating five-year rates since uh, June of last year, but now trendly, trending slightly upward. Uh, about a year ago, the rate for the five-year Treasury was uh, at least half of what it is now. Um, the Fed does forecast and anticipates uh, low yields continuing to the, the near future. Currently, the city's portfolio yield is slightly down this quarter, um, 1.177. The interest earned during the quarter, 487,000. Um, the current rates are slightly lower than they were in March. They've dipped again. Uh, the two-year is at 0.35%, um, three years at 0.79 four-year 115, and the five-year is at 1.52. So we are, are trending slightly above the four-year level. Here's a summary of our investment portfolio. Uh, total cash and investments of 170, almost 174 million. A significant portion of that is in LAFE, uh, earning a very low rate, but again, we do have to prioritize our security and liquidity. So this allows us to meet our, our needs throughout the year. Uh, another chart with the uh, with a four-year comparison of the city's portfolio uh, against the 90-day T-bill and the five-year, the LAFE rate, and the two-year. <coughs> city's portfolio is, is, is in the first blue column. And again, the, uh, in March, the five-year was at 173. We're about 151, 152 right now. Portfolio levels uh, for the last four years uh, ranged in a, from 164 million to, in March, 168. And this last chart just demonstrates where we're at with the current rates. Um, in the market with LAFE at 0.23, um, the five-year at 1.52. And that's just a brief overview and i um, happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for the report, for the overview. Uh, uh, questions from the commissioners? Any questions, comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just wanna say Thank you uh, for being here and uh, bringing this report. And I appreciate the fact that there are rules and we have to be very, very conservative. Um, one, one question, I don't have it in front of me, but just, just the discrepancy between projection and an actual. I'm, I'm fine with not making a whole lot of money and you know we don't have a ton invested, but just uh, I've noticed the past few years where we've been thinking we're gonna make a lot more than we do. Can you speak to that at all? Well, the projections are based, um, one, on uh, the portfolio rate at, that we're estimating for the coming year, and then also uh, cash balances for the coming year. So if those cash balances dip, then, then the earnings will be lower. And if that portfolio tends to uh, decline in yield, then it does affect that balance as well. So we revise the estimates each year, and then at mid-year we, we'll, we'll revise them again. So is, is any of this smoothed or it's just year to year? We, we do some historical analysis, but, and, and we do attempt to, to make some estimates of where we're going to be investing and what that yield is going to look like for the next year. And um, again, dependent on what this cash balances are by fund determines what that earning will be. Any other questions, comments? Again, thank you. Thank you very much for the report. It's interesting. And thank you, Corey, for asking to have it. Uh, next item of new business is item number seven, local coastal program update. Ms. Wazinski, would you read the staff report, please? Item seven, local coastal program update. Recommendation that Harbor Commission A receive a report on the city of Santa Barbara's local coastal program update and B consider appointing a subcommittee to provide input on the LCP update related to the waterfront. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, the city is about to take off on a pretty ambitious program to update its local coastal program. 
Um, so this evening I'm going to give you some background on the Coastal Commission, what the local co coastal program is, our area of influence, and then talk a little bit about the process. Um, the Coastal Commission was established in 1972, and the Coastal Act was adopted four years later in 1976, which extended the Commission's authority indefinitely. Uh, there, the Commission's authority and the Coastal Act its responsibilities include the protection of coastal resources such as public access, recreation, habitat protection, visual resources, commercial fishing, ports, etc. Those are the issues most relevant to the waterfront. The Coastal Act requires local gov governments to prepare a local coastal program. Um, the local coastal program has two main parts. The land use plan you'll hear a lot about are, is, are the policies, and the implement, implementation plan has to deal with zoning and is frequently included in the zoning ordinance. The city of Santa Barbara uh, first prepared in a local coastal program in 1986, which was approved by the Coastal Commission at that time. There have been multiple amendments to the local coastal plan, many, many amendments, one of which was the Harbor Master Plan in 1996, in which is included as Appendix F of the uh, local coastal program. And it's really the, the planning doc document that has guided the waterfront for almost two decades now. Um, planning staff and the city waterfront department are looking at possibly um, having this local coastal plan update obviate the need to prepare future harbor master plans. So that's why this particular update is, uh, is of significant importance to the waterfront. Um, the city planning department received a $123,000 grant to help pay for this update. Some of those funds go towards actually, I believe, uh, funding a staff member on the Coastal Commission so that they can dedicate time to it as well as some uh, planning staff as well. The land use plan, the policy portion of it, is going to incorporate relatively recent policies from the 2011 general plan, the 2012 climate action plan, the 2012 historic resources element, and the 2013 safety element update. And as I previously mentioned, the implementation plan related to zoning, most of that is probably going to be taken up with a, an updated zoning ordinance um, after the local coastal program land use plan is completed. By way of background, as far as our sphere of influence is concerned, um, in 1925, a grant from the state um, granted all the submerged land and accreted land from the mean high tide line out to the city limits at that time, which was a half a mile offshore. It also included a spur up to Goleta and into the Goleta Slough, which we now know as the airport. Um, there's been significant accretion of dry land since the harbor was completed in 1930. So what was the shoreline back at that time, which was the bluffs up behind the uh, Santa Barbara City College track, is now all dry land. So uh, hundreds of acres were accreted, and it really created the waterfront. That area has been sort of delineated and is referred to as the Harbor District in the Santa Barbara Mun Mun Municipal Code, Title 17. So you'll hear the term Harbor District thrown about quite a bit, and it really is the granted lands <clears throat> from the state from 1925, excluding the airport. The coastal zone itself extends um, the entire length of the city coastal area, and in general goes 1,000 yards inland with lots of different exceptions, including wetlands and a whole lot of different things, but in general, 1,000 yards inland from the mean high tide line. Within the waterfront, it's pretty much everything um, since we're so close to the coast. And there's two main components of the coastal zone that we are concerned with. The appeals jurisdiction, which is this kind of light brown area, and that's really where the local coastal program impacts the most. And what that means is when planning goes on there, permitting goes on, it's done at the local level and is uh, reviewed relevant to its consistency with the local coastal program. Whatever decision is made by the Planning Commission, typically, or Council, is appealable to the Coastal Commission itself. So that's what it means by the appeals jurisdiction. In red is the permit jurisdiction, or frequently called the original permit jurisdiction. Anything that happens in these areas goes directly to the Coastal Commission with some sort of cursory uh, city review, mainly uh, review to the extent that the city kind of supports whatever entity or whatever agency wants to do something. If we wanted to do something to the wharf, we'd go to city planning first and, and they would endorse it or hopefully, and then we would go and deal directly with the Coastal Commission themselves. The, the, co the local coastal program has component areas, Royal Borough, the Mesa, West Beach, so on and so forth, and the waterfront is its own component area, so it kind of makes things simple with respect to the overall effort to update the local coastal program. 
There are land use designations. There's about a dozen of them. But once again, in the waterfront, we have three, really, mostly two. Um, the Harbor Commercial Area, which is, really deals with ocean-dependent uses and visitor-serving uses, recreation and open space, and beaches is kind of a separate land use. And they deal with public access and habitat protection for the most part. And keep in mind, this is kind of an oversimplified uh, description of what the local coastal program entails, but as an introduction, I think it helps. The process uh, involves early review by coastal staff. So that's already happened. Um, city planning staff has taken all of the amendments and provided them to the Coastal Commission staff and uh, received some direction. They've uh, got a Bren School group working on uh, a, a draft on sea level rise. The city has done a sea level rise vulnerability assessment, and the Bren School students, I think, are refining that and focusing on some of the areas. Um, that they should have a, a report prepared in about a year, ready for public consumption. Draft land use policies and a few of the implementation plan zoning issues should be ready for public review in August 2015. They're going to emphasize usability, consistency, and sea level rise, which is going to be a very significant uh, component of this effort. The Planning Commission work sessions and early public input in the final order of sections to be determined. In your staff report, it describes some of the some of the sub some of the chapters and sub chapters in the sections and that really is the meat of the effort uh, there'll be a formal public workshop in September 2015 and this is after the draft plan is already done and selected uh, implementation plan sections with adoption by the city um, in March 2016 and um, submitted to the Coastal Commission in April 2016 so this is less than two years away this is a very ambitious plan um, in a very ambitious timeline. Uh, the, planning com the planning staff has solicited input from the Waterfront Department and Parks and Recreation, and like I said, this is going to probably be a fairly significant issue for the Waterfront and Harbor Commission to address as we get into the details of it. This is, like I said, a very, very broad overview, but uh, it's a very detailed and, and encompasses quite a bit. So this evening we are suggesting uh, or recommending that you consider appointing a subcommittee to provide input on a local coastal program update related to the waterfront issues. Um, one thing that, that Scott had mentioned we wanted to bring to your attention is in, at the July Harbor Commission meeting is when you normally appoint subcommittees. So it might be worth deferring if your appointment to that time if you are interested. Uh, what would be the role of the subcommittee? As the as this moves forward, um, each section is going to be reviewed in quite a bit of detail and rewritten. And I think it might be prudent for to have a subcommittee to kind of look into those details as opposed to the entire Harbor Commission all at once. Uh, something for you to decide. Uh, I, I think this is going to be a very, very exhaustive and comprehensive effort. This, like I said, this, bro this overview is very, very general and generic, but, um, and there's a lot going to go into this, and it's going to happen very rapidly. So as soon as we can provide input that looks at all the waterfront issues and uses, um, the better. Thank you. And I'd like to mention that June Pujo is the Planning Commission uh, liaison, and she's here this evening, and I believe... Okay, and there's a speaker step from her, yes? Would you like to come up, Ms. Pujo? Good evening, I'm June Pujol, and I'm the Planning Commission Liaison to the Harbor Commission. And I just wanted to take 30 seconds to say that, um, first of all, Mr. Triberg gave you an excellent report, helpful to me too, in terms of the um, relationship of the waterfront to the, uh, the coastal <clears throat> plan update process. It's excellent. But I want to, more than anything, um, strongly encourage you to create this subcommittee, create it tonight because um, it is a very ambitious schedule that the city has entered into. The grant funding is very strict in terms of timelines and deadlines, and it's our first opportunity in a lifetime for some to um, actually take a look at our coastal plan and the needed updates. It's very out of date, and it's just a perfect opportunity um, for your input. So I just wanted to mention that. and. Um, Thank you. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, if I may, um, our, our recommendation is uh, actually to, to form that committee in July. The reason being we will have a full complement of Harbor Commissioners here. 
Um, we have July is typically when we do form the commission, uh, the committees. Eric Friedman stepped down earlier in the year, so we need to fill his positions, and um, and there are others as well. So and since we won't be having a June meeting, so that's why we're suggesting a, that we would do that all in July. But I, as Ms. Peugeot mentions, very important to have a subcommittee active on this on this project. I, I appreciate that, but I wonder if if Ms. Peugeot could say whether uh, it would be important or desirable to have the subcommittee beforehand, uh, if, if two months would make a difference or not. Uh. Thank you. I can't tell you that I'm an expert on the exact schedule, but I do know it's very ambitious. And my thought was the sooner you can know ahead of time so you can start preparing for when the um, – workshops and meetings with staff need to take place and start going through the documents, that would be helpful. I, under, I, you know, I understand mm -hmm. your own um, particular scheduling issues and whatnot, so I leave that to you. But the soonest you possibly can, I would suggest that you do it. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. Perhaps one option would be if some of the materials were distributed to, to all of us, and so therefore when the committee was appointed or chosen or whatever, if there is one, we would be up Red and running for it. Uh, ben, sorry, Commissioner Sloan. Or, Madam Chair and Commissioners, the first thing we're probably going to do is bring the Harbor Master Plan back to you and sort of deconstruct it, let you know what we've done, what's in it, what's left, what we don't think we want to pursue. And I think that's going to provide the best framework for you to move forward with as it relates to the local coastal plan and, uh, program. And Scott and I have kind of discussed this already. So that's something we'd probably be doing in July. And I think it will help at that time, give the commission a better sense of the level of effort this is going to take. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sloan. Do we know when the schedule's coming out? Is there a date for when the schedule would be released? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Sloan, they are just starting to work with the Coastal Commission staff to pick the sections and the subsections they're going to work on, so we do not have that yet. I'm sure by July we're going to have a pretty good handle on what we're going to take on first. Is it public access? Is it habitat conservation, sea level rise? But we don't know it yet. Okay. So I, I would move to postpone until July, the selection of the subcommittee. Commissioner Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chair. It, just thinking about it and looking at how big the master plan effort was, what I would suggest that the commission might want to consider is actually maybe more than one uh, subcommittee, because that subcommittee might get worked to death, uh, and then actually divide up the various sections so that there are more than one subcommittee uh, so that whoever those members are, the two or three people, don't feel like, oh, we're doing everything. And that would spread it out and actually allow the commission to have more detail uh, from more people uh, and, I think, get a lot more work done more quickly. Okay. Thank you. Um, so... I think you made a motion, uh, Commissioner Sloan, to postpone. Uh, yeah, and I think Commissioner Kelly uh, brought up a good point. I think what we need to do is just table the discussion until July when we have more information and we can establish whether we need one subcommittee or more or things like that. So I think that would be my recommendation. Commissioner Bantlin. Okay. Any comments on it? Uh, okay, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Okay, uh, next item is the special event camping permit. Ms. Kuzinski, would you read the staff recommendation? Item 8, special event camping permit, Wine and Roses Regatta, recommendation that Harbor Commission A, review and consider a request for a special permit to allow event participant camping in the Harbor West parking lot from 5 p.m. Friday, August 15th, until 5 p.m. Sunday, August 17th during the 2014 Wine and Roses Regatta and B, approve Wine and Roses event chairman Steve Leo's request for participant camping for the upcoming event as allowed per Santa Barbara Municipal Code section 15.16.090. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, the Wine and Roses Regatta is a California State Catamaran Championship, and it has been happening at Ledbetter Beach 
uh, since August of 1996, and it's slated to happen again this year in August as well. It's put on by, the, by Southern California Hobie Cat Fleet and the Santa Barbara Yacht Club. Now, the boats and equipment um, that these, I should say, the Hobie Cats and the uh, assorted equipment that these folks leave on the beach can sometimes be very expensive. And for the past 15 or so years, um, this group has been asking the Harbor Commission, and the Harbor Commission has been granting them um, a permit to camp in the parking lot um, for the weekend. So although the Santa Barbara Municipal Code prohibits camping in public places, there is this one particular section in the Municipal Code that's provided as Attachment 1 that allows the Harbor Commission to uh, specifically designate um, camping along the waterfront jurisdiction in certain cases. Now the event, again, is scheduled. Um, they, the idea would be that they would come in on Friday, August, the, August 15th, and their permit would run from August 15th at 5 p.m. through that Sunday um, at 5 p.m. And these folks always leave the premises in good conditions. They pick up after themselves, and they do a really good job and work well with our staff. Now, the event is expected to use about 130 spaces. And here is a quick map. This is the Harbor West parking lot. This is the Loma Alta uh, entrance into the, into the parking lot and the harbor, as you can see, is over this way. So they, were, they plan, similar to last year, to use, or they're requesting to use 130 spaces. They would pay for these spaces at a cost of $1,300 per day, so a total of $2,600 for the weekend. And this is uh, ocean-dependent use, and Waterfront staff, again, supports this use of the waterfront facilities and the special event camping permit request. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, Commissioner Sloan. Have there been any enforcement issues that you know of? No, not a one. Um, they've been really good. Um, they've got it wired to the, at this point. Um, if they do come in before 5 o'clock, they would have to pay, um, like the public, with our Luke machines. Um, but once 5 o'clock hits, they set up camp. They're quiet. There's no raucous activity. Um, and they leave the, the place very clean, and they work well with our parking staff. We've gotten to know them quite well over the years. And uh, I noticed in your report you say that they've cooperated with local businesses. Haven't been any complaints from Shoreline Cafe or any of the restaurants in the harbor or anything? Not a one, and we hope that they're actually going to those facilities and eating and, uh, and buying some of their products. Well, that's great. I don't know how many events you can say that about. <laughs> but good. Any, uh, Commissioner Kelly? Uh, I would simply make the motion that we approve it. Second. Any comments, questions? Oh. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It is approved. And the last issue, the uh, staff and commission communications. Um, yes, Madam Chair, we have a couple of things tonight. First of all, um, I've been asked to... Um, remind you that there's the annual city advisory group's annual workshop coming up on Wednesday, May 28th at the city central library in the Faulkner gallery. And that will be from 4 30 PM to 6 PM. And this will be a good opportunity to meet the new city attorney, Ariel Colon. And, uh, he comes to us from Ventura where he was served as a city attorney in Ventura, but he's lived in town all this time. So it's really like uh, coming home for him. He's also been city attorney, I believe, in um, Boulder, I know, and several other cities, Palo Alto. Yeah. Um, so he comes very well qualified, very well recommended, and he will be um, leading a, uh, a presentation on the Brown Act, California's open meeting law, and the uh, Political Reform Act of 1974 and the importance of that to the, to the boards and commissions to uh, meet in open and public forums and, and be in compliance with those, with those uh, acts. So that's uh, communication from staff. I'd be happy to hear of anything from the commission at this point. Commissioner Kelly. Yes. Um, what I wanted to do is take this opportunity to thank the staff, well, basically to make an announcement, is to thank my fellow commissioners and the staff for having had the opportunity to work with you for 12 years. 
It's been a wonderful run, but uh, all things have to come to an end. So uh, this is my last Harbor Commission meeting. And so since we're not having a June one, there's nothing to not attend. And um, I wanted to thank everybody for the good time, but throw out two, you know me, I'm always a wild card up here. Uh, throw out two fun ideas. When you do the next harbor cleanup, what if the waterfront department made it a bit of a treasure hunt for those poor people swimming around in the muck down there? And we put something valuable to be found every time, and we GPSed it so that they're really rooting, and when they find it, they get to keep it, you know, you know a treasure-chested $100 bill that we, you know, let me tell you, they'd be turning that silt over looking carefully because it's down there. And if nobody found it, we'd know where to go get it. Something, something like that fun to do. But anyway, just, you know me, crazy ideas. And it's been a pleasure. And uh, there will be, because I let Scott know uh, earlier, so that I'm pretty sure the city council has my position up to be filled. And there'll be new shoes here in July. Thank you. Um. Comments? Uh I would just want to say, say thank you to you, Frank, for serving and um, being a wild card. Thanks. And I certainly think so. I mean, you were the, when I came, you, you taught me, I guess. Uh, and I really appreciated getting to know you. And I, think, and I think your points of view have been perhaps not always completely popular, but really, really valuable. And uh, I think you're going to be really missed. So, bon voyage. <laughs> If I may, I'd just like to add, uh, Commissioner Kelly started in uh, December of 2002 and, and with the Harbor Commission. Um, he served on the dredging committee and the budget committee. He's been quite active in the budget committee for many years. I think the entire time I was business manager working on the budget. Um, he was also chair of the Harbor Commission from um, October 2004 to September of 2011 for seven years I was chair of the commission for that length of time and, and of course serving on the commission for um, 11 years seven as chair and with an outstanding attendance record a really admirable attendance record he reminded me earlier earlier tonight he's keeping track he missed two meetings in all that time which is which is better than I can say so um, and so again we we really appreciate your service uh, to the to the waterfront and to the commission. Thank you. And we'll miss you in the harbor, as a neighbor. We're not leaving the harbor right away, but we're leaving paradise to go to another paradise. <laughs> Off to Kauai. So, uh, a motion to adjourn. Anybody? I'll, make, I'll second or make it. No, he gets to make it. You, okay, I'll make last it. official act. Okay. <laughs> second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> no? <laughs> yeah. We are adjourned. Yeah.